This is Floss Weekly, and I'm Joe Brockmeyer with Guillermo Amaral, and we are talking about Colab this week. Coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly, episode 322, recorded Wednesday, January 22nd, 2015, Collab. This episode is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Are you looking to upgrade your IT skills or prepare for certification? IT Pro TV offers engaging and informative tutorials streamed to your Roku computer or mobile device. For a free 7-day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account, go to itpro.tv slash floss and use the code FLOSS30. Hey, welcome to another episode of FLOSS Weekly. My name is Joe Brockmeyer. You may have uh, realized I am not, in fact, Randall Schwartz. He's on vacation this week. I'll be hosting the show, and I will be uh, speaking, co-hosting with Guillermo Amaral. Um, Let's bring Guillermo on. We're going to be talking with uh, somebody I've known for a number of years. His name's Aaron Siego. We'll get to that in a minute. Guillermo, how are you doing today? Hi, Joe. It's uh, really early in the morning here. What about like, uh, did you say 7.30 there? Yeah, yeah, it's 7.30 there. So uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm used to waking up at 10. What can I say? Have you, have you <laughs> caffeinated? Are you are you ready to do this? You've got, uh, you know, energy. Um, you're all good? <laughs> uh, no, no caffeine yet, but I, I'm no working ca- on that. May, I might get a, a caffeine injection soon. An injection. Okay. I, I didn't know we had that technology. I usually take it orally, but, you know, I guess uh, however however that works for you. So oh, yeah. um, today we get to, uh, I just learned this myself. Um, I should have been paying closer attention, but apparently we're going to be talking to a former co-host of Floss Weekly, Aaron Siego. He's going to be talking to us about uh, Collab, but you may also remember Aaron from such projects as KDE. Um, are you a Collab user, Guillermo? Uh, I am a co- uh, collab uh, contributor, actually. Uh, oh. I, I did a few work on, on Cyrus for them. Uh, and and if I remember correctly, he also works on KDE. I think he's kind of known for that, too. I, you <laughs> know, I've heard, I've heard that he's involved in some way or has had, had something to do sort of, you know, tentatively with KDE. Um, yeah. So you're, con- you're a contributor to collab. Well, I guess, uh, I guess that would mean that you're also a user. Uh, yeah, I, I, I use it for work. Well, uh, my, oh. my work uses Colab would be uh, a better description. Okay, okay. Um, well, let's bring him on in just a minute. But before that, we are going to uh, do a quick promo for you here. Whether you're looking to jumpstart a career in IT or you're already working in the field, IT Pro TV supplements traditional learning methods in a fun and engaging way to maximize your learning and prepare you for certification. IT Pro TV offers hundreds of hours of content, with 30 hours being added each week. Their library includes video courses on Apple, Microsoft, Cisco, and more, including A, CCNA, Security, MCSA, CISSP, and Linux Plus courses. They cover topics like network security, Linux, Windows, and OS X support for desktop servers, and more. But IT doesn't have to be boring. Shows are streamed live and are available on demand worldwide to your Roku computer or mobile device. You can also interact with hosts during the show and topic-specific web-based Q&As. If this looks and sounds familiar to you, it's because these guys behind IT Pro TV are huge fans of Twit. They have over 10 years of experience in IT learning and were inspired by Leo. They use the same studio setup and equipment that we do. Even if you're already studying with a book or enrolled in a certification or technical degree program, this is a fantastic supplement to learn at your own pace and track your progress. Measure up practice exams are also included with your subscription, and you're also going to get virtual machine sandbox lab environments for hands-on practice and learning with HTML5 support for any operating system. You get all this for one low monthly price, which includes daily updates and new features monthly. It's comparable to the cost of a study guide and much cheaper than going to an IT boot camp. Check out IT Pro TV 
slash floss to upgrade your brain with the most popular IT certifications recognized by employers. You're going to get a free seven-day trial when you sign up using our offer code, which will allow you to check out their courses, live stream, and more. Subscriptions are normally $57 per month or $570 for the entire year, but we have a special offer because they're huge fans of TWIT. If you sign up now and use the code FLOSS30, you'll receive 30% off your subscription for the lifetime of your account. That's less than $40 per month or $399 for the entire year. And once you reach your 13th month, they'll reduce your subscription rate even further, bringing your cost down to $24.95 per month or $249 for the entire year. That's itpro.tv slash F-L-O-S-S and use the code FLOSS30 to try it free for seven days and save 30%. All right, it's time to dive into the show. Let's bring back Yerbo and bring on Aaron. Are we all here now? I, I'm not sure. So. Oh, there you go. Okay. Hey. hey Welcome man. to the show again, Aaron. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Uh, I couldn't be happier. Well, that's not entirely true, but pretty well. Let's let's go with that. Um, <laughs> close so, enough. Close enough. Yeah. So. Today, you wanted to talk about Collab. Um, can you give us sort of the, uh, you know, we know vaguely what Collab is. It's collaboration groupware, but maybe you could expand on that a little bit because um, maybe not everybody in the audience is familiar with it. Sure. So what Collab is, is it's a free software or open source um, groupware suite. And it's a really highly componentized uh, application that obviously runs on the server, but we also ship clients for mobile and desktop. And it really does everything that you expect from groupware. So uh, it has the basics like email, um, calendaring, shared calendaring, of course, um, but it also has things like notes, to-dos, uh, for large organizations, things like being able to book resources, which is a feature I don't use, but I know people that do. Um, so it, it has all of these features um, combined into one package um, that scales from anything we have people that are running in their homes on Raspberry Pis, uh, all the way up to I know of at least one Fortune 50 company uh, that uses it on a six-figure seat um, deployment. Um, with two data centers, one in Europe and one in North America. So it's quite scalable um, and provides. Um, and we just today, actually, incidentally, um, it wasn't uh, planned quite this uh, <laughs> as a Machiavellian plan, but it worked out that just today we, we uh, released Collab Enterprise 14, which brings um, quite a few usability improvements, um, upgrade to the web application um, that uh, is based on Roundcube, um, and a number of features on the server side, such as the improved uh, notes and, and to-do integration. So how many people can you realistically support using a Raspberry Pi? Like what sort of uh, environment can you, right. could you, how many users could you handle with that? Yeah, so I mean, you're going to support a you know a household or maybe a very small office, um, and you've you've got to get um, storage attached to that as well. And but it, it basically works for you know a few people. Um, so we, the people that I know that are running it, they've got a couple of people, you know, three four accounts on it, and it seems to work quite well for them. Obviously, you're not going to be running all the bells and whistles off of the Raspberry Pi. Um, I don't know if, um, what the state of things like spam filtering or, or some of the more advanced logging features that we have now um, are on, on such a small device, but it basically works. And I think it's an interesting showcase for the fact that um, you, know, you can take software that scales to very large um, user bases or, or customer bases to something that you can fit on a tiny little uh, project computer and, and actually do something useful with. So I think you may have touched on this in the uh, elevator pitch there, but one of the things we want to talk about is the licensing for Collab. Um, you know, a lot of collaboration suites out there, but most of them are proprietary. You yes. want to talk about why it's important to have an open source suite for this? Sure. So there's a few reasons. Um, and looking at what else is out there, I mean, you mentioned there's some that are proprietary, um, but there's a good number of them that are partially free software and partially proprietary. And so there's a, quite a few open core models out there. Uh, Collab is one of the very few that is you know, free software from the top to the bottom. We don't ship any proprietary software. Um, 
Cool. It's all there. If you want to put it together yourself, you're you're free to do so. And there's nothing that's being hidden back in um, some you know separate enterprise component or such. Uh, that said, the reason why it's so important, at least in my opinion, to have uh, your communication going through a free software platform um, is number one. Uh, I mean, there's been such a series of ongoing revelations the last couple of years about um, the prevalence of um, surveillance and interceptive messages and, and whatnot. And if you have a free software solution, then you can take your uh, messaging back into your own hands and really take control of it again. You're not giving it into the hands of a third party corporation um, for which, you know, they don't have they have uh, obligations towards their their sovereign government that they you know the nation they live in, um, as much as they do to you. So with the, with a free software solution, you're once again in the driver's seat. Um, from a security standpoint, it has the benefits of, of free uh, software, especially since Colab um, is built on a lot of uh, well-tested, tried and true components such as Cyrus IMAP and the directory server that we use and, and such things. So um, a lot of the, the components, in fact, the majority of the components um, in Colab are integrated into a unified whole rather than being having been written from the ground up, which tends to be a better bet from a security standpoint. Um, and finally, if you're looking at it from an organizational or an institutional standpoint, um, it gives you a choice of vendor. You can either support the entire thing in-house, um, you can uh, engage with companies such as uh, Colab Systems for uh, proprietary or uh, additional development or integration with your existing um, IT infrastructure or enterprise support, etc. cetera. Um, but you can choose who it is who's giving you that service because it's free software. Um, and so there's no vendor lock-in that comes along with it. Uh, also, as kind of a byproduct um, of being free software is open standards are used extensively throughout the, the stack. Uh, so interoperability tends to be high because there isn't that vendor lock-in uh, side of it either. There's no reason and very little incentive to create uh, proprietary protocols that don't work well. Uh, with with other systems. And so what you find is if you have Colab, you can use it with your iPhone, you can use it with your Android phone or tablet, you can use it with your Windows or Mac laptop or desktop, you can use it with your Linux machine. And pretty much with everything, Windows, uh, mobile, BlackBerry 10, etc. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because of this usage and reliance on open standards um, and where we've needed to the adoption of um, uh, perhaps not what I would call an open standard, but um, de facto standards such as ActiveSync. So that reminds me, one thing I wanted to ask, a lot of companies, if they are considering Collab, they're probably already using something like Exchange. How does it interoperate with things like Microsoft Outlook, which is kind of hard to pry out of users' hands? Yeah, absolutely. So there, there's two things that we um, often do in that case. Uh, one is if you're running a relatively recent version of, of Microsoft Outlook um, using the uh, IMAP and the um, iCal, iDAV uh, backends uh, for or protocols that um, Colab uses, you can actually connect directly and start working with email and, and calendaring. Um, the other side, the other option is to go to um, the Colab desktop client, which is based on um, KDE's contact, which we actually provide um, pre-built binaries and support uh, on Windows as well as Linux, and it does run on, on Mac as well. Uh, and this gives you something that looks and feels a lot like um, Outlook, but it uses or gives you access to all the features, including things like um, notes and to-dos and resource booking, et cetera, that you won't get access to through Outlook. If you're using an older Outlook version, there are third-party uh, plugins that will connect um, older versions of Outlook to, uh, to Colab and give you that, that same integration that you can get rather easier with, with modern versions or, or more recent versions of Outlook. So, uh, Aaron, uh, how does it fare with something like a uh, iPhone or, in this case, an Android device? Yeah, so um, I actually use it on my phone um, every single day. Um, I get email, I get calendaring. Um, there are applications that you can um, well, actually access files on here as well um, over WebDAV. Um, so it works quite well. And we actually do test 
and make sure that it works with um, iPhones. When the new iPhone came out recently, we actually picked uh, one up for one of our engineers to make sure it worked. Um, and it actually, it, it uh, we had to make some adjustments <laughs> because there was some changes in what they did. Uh, but um, with Android, it works really well. Um, iPhone, it also works really well, and usually within native applications. So you can elect to use, um, you know, one of the oftentimes nicer applications from the App Store, um, and as long as they support uh, or use the open standards that um, everyone uses, including Colab, um, IMAP, WebDAV, iCal, iTip, etc., um, it'll work. Um, but yeah, it works generally with the the applications that come native with these phones. Uh, it also works with BlackBerry and Windows Mobile for people who have those phones. So uh, something like push not notification, that works fine. Uh, uh, yep. You know, just so somebody that doesn't know how IMAP works or or any right. of that uh, backend stuff works. Yeah, so we've got um, uh, push notifications with IMAP. Um, and for things like calendaring and whatnot, uh, we have active or and especially for devices that don't support all of the um, open protocols, we also have Active Sync, which is pretty much supported by all devices because uh, Exchange, being the de facto standard as mentioned earlier, has kind of pushed Active Sync on the world. So yeah, if you have a, a reasonably good application, you get everything like push notifications for email um, right out of the box. Um, and if you have less capable clients, then you can fall back to the active sync and that works also very well. Oh, great. So if I, if I want to, you know, give a uh, collab a try locally, like on my house and probably not on one, on one of my uh, raspberry Pis, uh, maybe I want to use the node desktop right. or something. Uh, is there a distro I can use? Does it, are, are you guys supplying a, a full distro with everything, everything installed or do I have to use my own uh, my own Linux distribution and install packages, or, or how, how would that work? No, you get to pick your your distribution of choice. So um, at Collab Systems, we support mostly enterprise uh, distributions because those are what our clients use. So things like RHEL, um, Univention, Corporate Server, um, this sort of thing. But uh, Debian um, six seven are supported. Um, you can run on CentOS, obviously, because that's compatible with um, uh, with RHEL. Um, I know people who are running it on a variety of, of platforms, however. Um, so it's nothing too exotic um, in terms of the, the set of packages. When, when Colab first started a long time ago, they used their own packaging system and kind of bypassed the system packaging. And I think a lot of, there's still a lot of people out there who kind of remember those days. Um, and these days it just uses the regular native packages, so RPM or, or dev or whatnot. And so you can find a package for quite a few uh, very popular um, Linux distros out there. Um, a lot of Debian-based ones as well as RPM ones. Oh, nice. And uh, let's say if I just want to, you know, an, an email, I want to uh, drop like Gmail you know, Google, mm -hmm. maybe Evil and stuff. If I if I want to, you know, just get an email that has uh, Colab, you know, is there a service out there for that? Yeah, there is actually. So um, we host a rather large instance of Colab uh, here in Switzerland, where I currently am. Um, and that's specifically, we specifically chose that jurisdiction for legal reasons. And um, it provides a very high bar of, uh, or, um, you know, invade your privacy and say, hey, show us the email. Um, and it's completely transparent as well. So by keeping it in Switzerland, we've got a really good legal, a legal uh, jurisdiction. Uh, as a company, our policy is we don't um, look at anything that you put on there. It's, yeah, your business. Uh, um, we don't advertise. Uh, I mean, that's really one of the challenges, right, with with the Google model is it's um, completely free, as in you don't pay any money. You're using a proprietary service, um, but really the way that they make their money is by advertising to you. And so to do that, they have to process your your data. We don't do that. Instead, it's a, a uh, uh, user pay kind of situation where you pay a monthly fee. So if you go to mycolab.com, um, which will shortly actually be collabnow.com, we're right in the middle of, of um, rebranding these things. Um, but yeah, right now it's mycolab.com. And people watching this in two or three weeks or a month or a year will go to Collab Now, uh, and you can sign up right there. Um, kind of an interesting side note, the web application that we use, which has uh, provides um, access to email, shared calendaring, notes, to-dos, the whole bit, tagging of things, etc., cetera, um, that is based on Roundcube, and which is probably the world's most popular um, web 
mail application. There's over half a million installs we know of globally. Um, and that is uh, something that we actually also contribute to. In fact, the two primary developers um, are are supported by, sponsored by, um, employed by actually uh, Collab Systems. Um, and so we really try and contribute to the upstream projects that we use. Um, and yeah, so if you use uh, my Collab and use the web interface as opposed to a desktop client or whatnot, um, yeah, you'll be using uh, RoundCube. So uh, let me jump back in here, Aaron. Uh, mm -hmm. Back in the day, I've hosted my own, you know, pretty much everybody who's been doing free software for a long time, I think, has probably hosted their own email at some point. And, and many of us have uh, yep. gotten away from that because, you know, configuring Postfix or Axum or whatever by hand is um, mm -hmm. something you should do once and, and maybe only once. But uh, I'm <laughs> curious... I'm curious, like, how hard is it? You know, you mentioned there are packages available and all that, but how hard, hard is it for an individual to actually set up and run their own domain if they were going to do self-hosting? Sure. So um, I, I won't lie to you. I mean, it's it's not a casual, um, you know, spend five minutes and, and you're done um, sort of process um, because as with any server, it needs maintenance and upkeep, right? And if... Um, issues arise, you will need to, you know, provide, uh, apply security updates and, and whatnot. Um, that said, I think it's made it about as easy as it can be. So what Colab does is it brings together uh, things such as, um, by default, Cyrus IMAP, the, um, the uh, 369 directory service, um, Mavis, and on and on and on. Um, and it pre-configures all of these things. You basically give it your collab configuration and it configures all these pieces for you uh, and gets them running, not just individually, but also together as a, as a whole. Um, so collab really makes it as easy as possible to go from zero to running. Um, and you can do this if you follow the documentation, which are actually really, really quite um, uh, thorough and, and easy to follow kind of step-by-step -step things on docs.collab.org. Um, you can be up and running pretty quickly. Um, and once it's done that setup, uh, it, it, you have, you know, the Cyrus IMAP and the directory service and all these other components as you normally would. Um, and if you want anything more uh, with it or you want some specific kind of configuration um, tweak, then you can actually usually consult the documentation of those specific projects as well and they'll remain relevant. Um, so in that sense, um, it's, very, it's a very thin kind of a configuration wrapper on top of a lot of... Uh, existing free software components plus uh, a bunch of ones that we have written to fill in some of the the uh, the cracks in between in between those pieces uh, but yeah so when you set it up you install the packages define your collab config and then it does a one-time configuration of the entire system to orchestrate all these pieces okay and you mentioned I just want to clarify because I think you mentioned 369 uh, directory server it's actually 389, yeah, 389. I think yeah, I yeah. always, I'm always thinking, is it 369, 389? That's why I actually took a moment to pause and I got it wrong. I should have had that up in front of me. Yeah. No worries. No worries. So it sounds like um, for my folks, if I wanted to, so I host, a, you know, I use a third party. I don't use Gmail, but I use a third party to host Zonker.net email. Um, can you do, if I go to my collab or, um, you know, the other one in a few weeks, can you do... Uh, you know, custom domains, or is it you're stuck with yep. that that domain? No, no. So we provide a number of stock domains. If you don't want the i at mycollab.com or in the future at collabnow.com, um, that we have a bunch of other stock domains. But you can also have your own domain. So you register your domain and you point the MX record um, at our service. You uh, create a a uh, group account, it's called, and you get a domain name included. Um, it's uh, really not much more uh, to do that, actually. And, and then you have your own domain. And you can put in one account or 10 accounts um, in, in, on that domain. Okay. Um, and you touched on a little so no, bit. We do I support wanna... uh, multiple. You can have one install. Sure. Oh, sorry. I think uh, there was a little interference on Skype. Please, oh. please go ahead and finish. Yeah. 
Uh, I was just going to say that one of the neat things with Colab is that it's um, multi-domain right across the board. So you have one installation, you can have multiple um, different domains that you can actually define what uh, what the um, uh, the policies are for emails between them and, and whatnot. Okay, great. Now, earlier on in the podcast, we talked about, uh, you know, what's in Switzerland stays in Switzerland. And obviously, uh, there is a lot of concern these days about NSA snooping and other countries looking in on our data. What um, have you actually, I mean, people talk about that, but I've found that a lot of people talk about that, but maybe don't take action. I'm curious, are you actually seeing a major uptick in business or interest from people because of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, both individuals as well as as business um, people have really, you know, I think taken notice of this. I, it's, a lot of people um, still, I think, they don't feel that their data is of, is important enough or valuable enough, and does it really matter? Um, but there has been a significant uh, number of people that have realized, that, yeah, this is this is important and needs. They want to do something about it, and so they either go to self-hosting um, or they come to my collab and entrust their data with us. So, how how secure is the uh, my collab service? Uh, I mean, with all this uh, North Korean hackers, you know, going around <laughs> yeah. stealing movies and and you know personal data, is my collab you know actually you know truly secure in in that sense? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we have a dedicated security team. In fact, one of the main partners that we have with uh, Colab Systems um, is a, a quite a reputation, actually, security company in Bern, Switzerland, uh, Dream Labs. Um, they provide the security um, around my Colab, or at least audits it and have set it up and made sure that everything continues to be in place. Um, we do receive attacks from time to time. Um, we do track them. Um, to our knowledge, no one has been successful in breaching uh, those defenses. And, and part of the reason why is because we don't just have a single line defense. We don't just rely on, well, it's, it's free software, it's going to be secure. Um, we really believe in depth of defense on the one hand. So there's a large number of hurdles that have been set up that people have to uh, get through to be able to actually compromise the system. Um, one of the things that helps is in the, in the design of Colab itself. Uh, there's the concept of principle of, or, or the um, yeah, the principle of, of least privilege. So each component, because it's a highly componentized um, server uh, suite, each component has only the privileges it requires, and no more and no less, right? So this allows us to run um, some parts of the system with very few privileges, um, and and only the core pieces that really need to be able to do more have access to. To such things, so not only is there this is there this um, depth of defense in front of the system, but the system itself has been designed from a security perspective um, that really makes it a a a uh, target with a smaller attack surface and something that's just generally more onerous to get into. And with the um, open open uh, open SSL issue that happened uh, maybe a year ago now, I can't quite remember. Mm -hmm. uh, do you guys do what? Well. Uh, a better question would be, uh, how would that affect Colab or, or uh, not just the uh, my Colab service, but somebody hosting Colab? Is that uh, right. something the uh, distro would need to handle? Or are you guys in charge of your packages on every single distro out there? For OpenSSL, no. So for OpenSSL, we rely on um, distribution packages. When Heartbleed did hit, we patched our uh, the MyCollab service, however, um, with our enterprise clients. We helped them address the issue, of course. Um, and so, yes, I mean, we were patched uh, absolutely as quickly as humanly possible. We didn't wait on, you know, well, when's this, when are the packages going to arrive kind of thing. Um, so we are on the MyCollab hosting service, we're extremely proactive. Um, if you're self-hosting, then yes, for things like OpenSSL, we rely on, on the system packages. We don't try to reinvent everything from the ground up. That said, this may be changing slightly in the future because the idea of containerized deployment is becoming more and more uh, popular, and we've been spending quite a bit of time recently looking at how we can deploy um, uh, Colab as a set of Docker containers, um, and that may actually will will end up changing the landscape there a bit, uh, where you'll actually have containers that have the um, 
uh, necessary crypto bits in it, and then you would update those containers rather than rely on on uh, traditional OS packaging. Yeah, the uh, the container idea is something I, I actually like a lot. I especially since I use PCBSD a lot on on a few mm -hmm. uh, computers here at home. You know, having everything bundled up is just yep. the best when you want to update something without breaking every single package on your system, right? Yeah, exactly. And since Collab is designed to scale horizontally by uh, being a lot of components and a number of these components can actually be run on multiple servers themselves, um, having containers is really handy. So we use things like Puppet, of course, right now um, to automate the management of, of large numbers of systems um, all at once. Um, but I think it's to really lower the barrier in terms of, of how much effort and, and how reliable and repeatable um, deployment is. So since we're talking containers, I thought I'd jump in a little bit there. Um, you have been around the industry for a while, as as I have. I'm kind of curious where you fall on, like, what do you think are Docker containers sort of the future of packaging for folks, or do you think it's a little overhyped, or where do you where do you fall on the whole containerization thing? So I don't know if Docker itself will be the thing that we are living with in 20 or 30 years time. I think it's a little bit early to to call that, um, but I think that containers and what I think they'll eventually um, evolve into. I mean, it's still very early days for this technology, I think. Um, but I think what they'll eventually evol evolve into um, are it probably is going to be what, at least for more complex applications, what people um, turn to for deployment and management. Uh, I think it does make things a lot, um, not only a lot easier, but more repeatable. Um, I do think there are challenges to be faced and, and met in terms of um, security and whatnot. There's a lot of people who just throw up a, here's my Docker image, and then people download it and run it without even thinking about checking what's in it. Um, I think that's a little dangerous, but I think with the, with time that will that will mature and, and, and become better. But yeah, I think I think containerization uh, is probably going to become a, um, if not the dominant, a extremely prevalent and and co-dominant um, way of of deploying software. <sighs> One of the things I've noticed is that, yeah, as you mentioned, you know, people are kind of like virtualization uh, was several years ago. People use it without maybe taking advantage of the um, the medium itself. You know, they, they hear containers and so they think, okay, we'll just throw everything into one container. Um, have you, you're experimenting with this now, so maybe this is premature to ask, but I'm curious. Have you run into any best practices for containerizing something like Colab or any, you know, any tips or tricks for people who are looking at containerizing an application in the enterprise? Yeah, so I mean, Colab is is a bit of a outlier um, in that you know it's not like WordPress. Okay, you have WordPress and then you've got a, a uh, SQL database and PHP and you're done, right? Um, Colab is, you know, a few dozen components, and by components, I mean these are actually standalone servers that that work with each other. Um, and so, what we're actually experimenting with now, and it's not a finished thing, but uh, we're making, I think, pretty good progress, is putting each group of um, components that that belong together uh, as a functional unit into their own container. So, deploying Colab would actually come in a set of containers. And you'd be able to deploy all of them on one machine, but then you could also say, well, I'm going to deploy this container on that server or this container on that server, or you could have one, one very large machine with a bunch of virtual machines in it, you know, a typical cloud um, situation where you have uh, elastic amount of resources all running in VMs. And you can deploy different containers, uh, which are different pieces really of Colab um, into the different uh, systems. And this makes it both a little, um, a little more straightforward in terms of packaging, so we're not just delivering this huge, immense number of packages in one uh, container. Instead, you have a bunch of small containers that can work together, um, and it makes the the horizontal scale up a little bit more with it at the moment. But again, Colab is a bit of a complex uh, beast when it comes to if you actually look behind the scenes and all the the number of components that are going into it. All right, and you mentioned. Uh Briefly, you mentioned Puppet earlier. I wonder if you're looking into anything like uh, Kubernetes or anything as far as orchestration between the containers. 
So I don't know that we've been looking into um, that specific set of tools. Um, we are right now looking at, yeah, how do we how do we manage containers? I think that's really um, mostly an open question at the moment. Um, there aren't many applications right now that come as, you know, 15 or 20 separate containers that are supposed to all work together. Um, so in some ways, I think we're, we're in uncharted waters. And I, it'll be interesting to see how it develops over the next, you know, four or five months. Um, we hope to have a containerized version, you know, sometime mid-year. So uh, pulling pulling everything back to a you know the a little a little bit more a software engineering oriented questions, yep. uh, how we you guys uh, uh you mentioned you guys have a uh, a lot of bundles inside Colab mm -hmm. which include uh, Cyrus and and um, yep. you know all all those different um, uh, utilities that uh, you know make up the uh, service in, in itself. Uh, do you guys upstream your changes? How how, how does that work? Uh, I'm guessing either you guys support them somehow. Yeah, so with um, a lot of upstreams, we are part of the upstream community. Um, so with Cyrus IMAP, for instance, we have um, a committer there um, who contributes to, to Cyrus IMAP. With the desktop client contact, um, we have a few people that uh, commit and upstream there. Um, we provide uh, the Windows builds, make sure that they work, for instance, uh, that gets um, with Roundcube, the webmail application, we're, we actually do the bulk of, of development on it now. Um, not exclusively, obviously, but the, the main developers are on our team. And so we are kind of the upstream uh, to that as well. And for projects that we aren't the upstream to, then yeah, we definitely contribute patches. In fact, um, I still do some some software development myself uh, in my ripe old age here. Um, and I actually just contributed a, a couple of patches last week to an upstream project on, on GitHub that we were looking at. So um, yeah, I mean, we very much believe in the sensible path of contribute changes upstream. Um, it keeps our delta smaller. Um, it makes it just a lot easier to track useful changes that happen upstream as well. Okay, okay. So uh, Colab in, in itself is a, it's a business, right? Uh, are you guys hiring uh, software engineers to work on Colab or do you take contributions? Do you do both? We do it all. So at Colab.org, there's the community kind of around that. Um, that will be actually also be going to, although Colab.org will still be there, um, we're going to be moving that um, to uh, Colab community and augmenting the tools that are there already uh, this year. Um, but yes, the community is there. Um, Git repositories and whatnot are all open. Um, we take patches from people. Uh, the uh, Raspberry Pi stuff I mentioned earlier was actually done by a community member. Really quite cool stuff. Um, we're on IRC, as you'd expect, and irc.freenode.net. So we've got the whole community side. Um, and I'd love to see that actually um, grow because the groupware and, and communication suite side is, I think, an area of free software that doesn't have as large a contributor um, community as, as it probably deserves. Um, on the other side, yes, we also have Colab system element um, that we pay for or that our clients pay for. Um, but that all happens as well um, in, in community repos. Um, so we, while there's the company and the community, it kind of all happens in, in the same general proximity. So um, you've mentioned a couple of times that you're rebranding different properties. Uh, I'm kind of curious, what inspired that? Like why, why move from mycolab.org or .com and so forth? Sure. So uh, why now? Um, because I was coming on your show, of course, I had to have something to talk about. So I was like, let's rebrand everything. <laughs> no. Um, no, the, the, the real reason was, uh, I mean, Colab Systems has been around for a few years now. And um, we've been, you know, taking on larger and larger projects. As you probably heard, we're doing the uh, groupware for Munich, the city of Munich, which is a forty thousand uh, person deployment. It's fairly significant. Um, I mean, they have system uh, in their system. They have some like two hundred thousand calendars that they have to deal with, um, not just the calendaring side of it. So, you know, fairly significant. Um, and as the, the company has grown and as Colab has has started to really spread its wings. Um, and over the last you know, few years, piece by piece, 
uh, the the server has been you know, refactored and where necessary um, improved and re-engineered. Um, so there's this whole kind of you know four years, five years of of work that's gone on, um, and at this point it just made sense to step back from you know the kind of the startup phase. Okay, we've got a logo, good enough whatever and get something that was done that we think reflects the you know professional nature of of collab and what the actual value proposition in it is um you know just the right time to do that so we're harmonizing everything um yeah the change from my club to collab oh that was part of a very uh, company that helped us through that process of of um you know identity and and messaging and whatnot um so hopefully this will be the the last time we do this ever, uh, but I think it, the the results already. If you go to um, collabsystems.com dot um, uh, or the re- the one released today, which is um, Collab Enterprise um, or dot uh, com, you can go to. I think that the I think it, it speaks for itself. The, the branding is um, yeah significantly better, um, and and the our goal with all of that is to really try and bring um, collab and free software in general to more uh, more people. I mean, in, in Munich was a good example. They got a new mayor and his first thing that he did when he came in was like, do we really, should we really be using free software? <laughs> uh, and, and that was, a, I think, a scary moment for everyone who was involved in the Linux deployments there. Um, and one of his complaints was, was groupware. Um, ironically, they were not using a free software groupware system at the time that he made that complaint. We're, we're working on that uh, right now, actually. So things should be much better for him. Uh, shortly, uh, with with groupware and being able to get his stuff on his phone, which is which is what his complaint was, but um, yeah, we we feel that uh, there really hasn't been enough of a of a push to bring um, the great free software we do have for groupware um, into the you know the professional uh, arena, and so we wanted to kind of up our our game in terms of identity and messaging uh, to reflect our goals. Okay. And under the theory, you know, under the idea that there's always room for improvement, I'm kind of curious, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about, are there areas in CoLab where you think uh, s- significant improvement is needed, where you would call for community contributions or where, you know, the roadmap for the next year or so, where you know that CoLab is going to be significantly improving in one or in an area or other? Yeah, so there's um, a couple of interesting places. Uh, one is on on the client side. There's a bunch of work being done uh, in KDE's contact group or suite that we use for the desktop clients. Um, there's the porting effort that just finished to Qt 5 and Frameworks 5, KDE Frameworks 5, that is. Uh, but there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and yeah, I think there's significant opportunity for some really interesting contribution there. Uh, some of the other things that we're working on the uh, this year uh, are in the area of data loss prevention. Um, so we have a fairly new set of, of um, uh, projects uh, that center around basically being logging on steroids specifically for group or data. So it logs events, um, you know, when someone uh, deletes a folder or deletes an email or gets a new mail or a user is created or these kinds of things. Um, and it logs this into a separate key value store uh, for later um either business intelligence or yeah data loss you know if if someone deletes a calendar you should be able to go back and get it out of there so that's the uh, and also audit trail so you actually go and see uh, one of the things that happens there once in a while is someone will say um i, I made an event on an, on a calendar i shared it with somebody now it's no longer there what happened and what actually happens is the person deleted it from their shared calendar and put it on their private calendar so these kinds of things will be um easier to troubleshoot with with this logging so that's something that we're working on quite a bit this year. Um, I think it's quite interesting. Um, and because it's a new part of the project, there's lots to be done there. Um, and then there's little kind of edge of the um, of the system thing. So we have the file storage, which is really quite neat, I think, where you can get a, an attachment on your email and um, and at least in Roundcube and Contact as well, you'll, you'll be able to say, just save this file to the cloud. Don't download it locally. And at that point, it goes into the file storage that's integrated with with Colab. And that file storage, um, the default file storage, is it gets stored in the IMAP 
uh, store, um, which makes backup easier and makes it zero configuration. But um, you can have different file storage backends. So we already have written one plugin for uh, C file, which is a open source uh, free software cloud, a uh, file cloud, um, very much I think like Dropbox um, in a lot of ways, or it chunks files up into into smaller pieces, so you don't use immense amounts of bandwidth if you have gigantic files that only small parts of them change um, during synchronization. They've got sync clients for you know across the board, all the all the platforms. Um, so that's really nice for people using C file, but of course there is a lot of other file options, uh, file cloud options out there. A lot of other systems that people use for that. Um, and so people looking to contribute could, uh, as an example, write a uh, backend. There's a the project called, um, I call it, I pronounce it Twala, although it's, I think, Kala or something like this. Um, uh, and it has backends. It's written in PHP. And you re-implement one PHP class that has things like, um, you know, list the files, um, save a file, fetch a file, et cetera. Um, and you implement um, the correct hooks for whatever backend you're going. And then suddenly Colab can now save to, um, to cloud or, or load from cloud and export over, you know, uh, web dev and all of these other magical things um, from that new system. So if someone wanted to work on integration with insert your favorite cloud storage project here, um, that would be something that would not be a huge project, but would probably be useful to everyone else who uses that same uh, storage system. Aaron, uh, you mentioned KDE. Uh, I'm sure both of us are very familiar with uh, how KDE and what KDE yep. is, and 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 well, the community in general. There, how, how would a collab uh, compare with a KDE, and is it tied together in some way, or uh, how does that work? Yeah, so I mean, well, collab um, has a lot of KDE roots in the sense that the people who did the original engineering um, around collab. Um, also had affiliations with the KDE project um, that from day one contact uh, was the desktop client for Colab. In fact, a lot of development of, of things around security and, uh, and uh, uh, crypto actually happened um, to support the needs of Colab back then. Uh, to this day, we uh, employ a couple of people that work on KDE stuff, um, uh, Christoph being, uh, or Christian, sorry, Molokov being one of them. Uh, and so they work directly on upstream KDE software. So Colab, the server itself, um, the web client, and if you're using it with mobile or, you know, Thunderbird, obviously has no, you know, hardware connection to KDE. But um, if you use the contact suite, then yes, obviously there's, there's a KDE connection there. And yeah, in the, in the, Right from its beginnings all the way to kind of modern times, there's there's some personnel overlap, if you will, uh, between between the projects. Um, how do they compare? I mean, Collab is is um, obviously much more focused. KDE is this large uh, umbrella community that has a whole bunch of different projects. Collab is very focused. We do you know groupware, you know the whole collaborating confidence uh, idea, um, and so are, and as well the the number of people that contribute to it are not. Um, as large as you would find in KDE, um, in, in no small part, probably because I think a lot of people look at at uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, do I would that really be useful to me? Why would I want to contribute to that? Um, I think that uh, in in that light, if if people actually gave it a try, I think they'd find it more useful than they they might imagine. So um, we're, we're getting towards the end of the hour and there are a couple of standard questions. Now, having uh, been a former co-host, you've probably answered these before, but uh, we're going to, for the new folks in the audience, let's go ahead and, and uh, entertain those folks with these. Favorite programming language? Ah, ah, don't have one. Um, I do a lot of, of uh, coding in C++. Um, I don't hate it. Um, it's getting better actually, which is bizarre for a language. Um, most languages tend to get worse with age, I find, because they get bigger and bigger and rare. But there's been some really nice things that happened in C++ recently. Um, and yeah, what's coming down the pipe looks even nicer. Uh, I've been doing some projects in Erlang recently, and I really quite enjoy that. Um, it's a 
different way of, of developing, you know, emphasis on concurrency and, and whatnot and asynchronous message passing, which is interesting. But I, I don't have a favorite language. I think that um, you have to ask yourself, uh, given the task I'm trying to, you know, to do, what is the, the language that makes the most sense? Okay. Um, this one's a little harder to weasel on. What is your favorite uh, text editor? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. So I am a Vimmer. Um, All right. For a while. Oh, man. So, oh, man. yeah. I, I also use Kate from time to time. Actually, if on, depending on the project, I use Kate or Vim, but I, I am a long time Vimmer and it is generally what I do all my text processing in. Okay. And last uh, preference question here. It's yes. closing time. You have time for one more song at karaoke. What's your go to? <laughs> one more. I, who told you I like karaoke? Um, <laughs> wow, one more song at karaoke. And um, if I hadn't already sung it, probably uh, I would do Hallelujah. There we go. Oh, excellent. Is, is that the uh, Leonard Cohen version or wh who's the other one who did uh, an excellent rendition of Hallelujah? Most people know Rufus Rainwright, thanks to Shrek. Um, that's but yeah, so it, it's it, that's the version. I mean, he's doing the Jeff Buckley version, really. Um, and so I would say I would do the Jeff Buckley version, but, um, yeah. Oh. All right. Uh, Aaron, thanks again for being on the show. Was there anything else that you wanted to add? We didn't ask you about during the show. Uh, not otherwise, other than, you know, encourage people to go check out, uh, collab.org, give it a spin. Um, and if you have questions or queries, I mean, we're on IRC or email, uh, the mailing lists, um, pretty much 24 seven. Okay. And if, um, you know, uh, those of us in the industry tend to travel a bit. Any shows or events that folks in the audience might see you at? Are you going to be at FOSDEM in a couple of weeks, for example? Yeah, we will be at FOSDEM. Um, we're also we've got the Collab Summit coming up that will be co-located with the OpenSUSE conference um, in May, the beginning of May. So there's just in the next couple of months, you've got uh, at least two really good chances to come and see us. All right, excellent. Thanks again, Aaron. Guillermo, uh, what did you think of the show today? Any thoughts on Collab? Is, is that something you're likely to uh, jump into using? Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest and say that groupware is not super exciting for me, <laughs> uh, or uh, at least uh, not currently. But I, 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 do, I do use it at work, and I, I am interested in probably playing around with it on the uh, Raspberry Pi a bit, you know, just to have a little home uh, system. Because uh, currently I have my Gentoo system uh, running a mail server, which you know gives us an internal email system here. But it would be nice, you, you, you know, just to have a Pi doing that. I have a ton of them there, so you know it'll be a lot less uh, power um, power usage if I switch over to that. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I think the whole point of collaboration software actually is to be boring. It's basically as long as it works and nothing <laughs> is on fire, it's good, you know, as long as it has the features that you want. Um, any place uh, you're going to be traveling, is any place uh, you're going to be at or anything you wanted to throw out um, before we wind up the show? Well, I feel obligated to uh, plug scale 13x. Uh, so if anybody's there, uh, there on, uh, in LA, on the uh, on February nineteenth uh, to the uh, twenty two, I think twenty second. Uh, you should check that out. It's at the uh, Hilton LAX um, uh, hotel. So just go there. I'll be there. I know Randall will be there, and um, uh, a lot of uh, well, a lot of us will probably be there. I'm, I'm guessing you you'll also be there, right, Joe? I will be. Actually, we're running uh, we're running a Fedora Activity Day around cloud on Sunday, and I'm running uh, a one day event on Friday called Infrastructure.next. And so, anybody who's interested in the future of data open source in the data center, so Docker containers, Kubernetes, CentOS, all of that good stuff, if they want to learn about that, show up on Friday. No charge. We just want to see people there. Um, and, and so I, I look forward to seeing you at scale and maybe we can share a beer or a coffee or whatever it is your preferred drink. Um, so both work, both work. Don't worry. I, I'll even take them at the same time. I don't, I'm not picky. One after the other usually yeah. is, is the best. Yeah. Okay. All right. And, uh, I'm Joe Brockmeyer. Once again, you can catch me at uh, projectatomic.io for my day job. Um, so if you have any interest in running Docker containers, uh, check that out. 
And before we head out into the sunset, I want to remind you that this episode is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Are you looking to upgrade your IT skills or prepare for certification? IT Pro TV offers engaging and informative tutorials streaming to your Roku computer or mobile device. For a free seven day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account, go to itpro.tv slash floss and use the code floss30. That's been the episode for this week. I'm Joe Brockmeyer. Have a good week. Thanks for joining us.